the bee industry, John, is getting pretty close to being unified. Well, we have a, a, a wonderful expectation that by uh, the end of our conference, which is in June in Taupo, that the industry will be giving us the green light to move forward and uh, go through the final process of, of bringing the industry under one um, industry entity. So who are the... who? Who are the groups at the moment that you're trying to bring together around a table? Well, I, th I guess at the end of the day, the, the, the biggest group is, is the ones that are, are actually belong to no, nothing or nobody to, or no industry groups. So they are the, the serious uh, large uh, group of unwashed out there that we haven't yeah. yet been able to bring into an industry group. Obviously, we've got Federated Farmers and the National Beekeepers Association, and we have the Honey Packers and Exporters Association. So those three uh, groups have been working together uh, with an industry working group over since September last year and we've progressed that through to this point uh, and within the next week uh, the uh, communication which I've showed you just this morning will be heading out to uh, to all beekeepers and all industry pl players right across all sectors for, to bring them up to date with where we're at. So the, the amateur that's got two or three hives in the backyard and, and are doing the neighbours uh, sort of apple trees yes, a favour. Yeah, yeah. uh, are you looking for them as well? Absolutely. So our, our numbers now are almost at 5,700 beekeepers in New Zealand and in the last 12 months over 790 new entrants and of those new entrants a very large proportion are sitting in that hobbyist sector so they play a, a very important role. We expect I, I think by December that we'll have uh, 6,000 beekeepers and over 600,000 hives in the country and uh, so that's a, it's a, it's a big number. Uh, and there's a lot of education and a lot of communication that we need to do to all these new entrants to bring them up to speed of the requirements of our, our industry and disease control and all the other things I that are I think you've, just, uh, you've answered my next question <laughs> actually <laughs> because I was going to say what's in it for the person with two or three yeah. hives in the backyard. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's really what it's about. It's about education. It's about knowing what is right and what is wrong. You know, we're handling a food product. People consume it and we need to be doing everything right to ensure that we uh, maintain the standards and you know the really high respect that honey has as a food product around the world. Are these hobbyists, because that's one of the groups that you're after, are, are they using that for themselves and just providing a few friends or can they put it into the mainstream? Uh, interesting because I've just done that exercise the other day and we have I think something like uh, the numbers about five just under five thousand hobbyist beekeepers in New Zealand. Really? Um, and they they own about twenty five thousand hives so if we took a conservative estimate and said that uh, each hive produces 15 kilos of honey and the average household at absolute best probably consumes 10 kilos of honey um, and if a beekeeper's got more than one hive, which is, which is exactly what it shows, mm. um, the reality is that we are pro they're producing, I guess, over 500,000 kilos a year, more than they could consume in their own homes. So, so they can give some of it away, I yeah, guess. I guess well, that would be one of the things, yeah, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a case of you know, all the aunts and uncles and, yep. and everybody that you know, the cousins, the neighbours, all Correct. get some honey. Correct. Which, must, which, which in reality is kicking you professionals right in the, in the teeth. Maybe, but I mean, for us today, we don't have enough product to meet our export demand. Ah, so so okay. it doesn't have that impact. Had it been... Back in the mid-80s, that would have been the opposite, where we were totally reliant on our domestic market and very little product went for export. Then it would have certainly have affected how things operate. But today, with the demand that we have internationally, um, that's not an issue. So as, as an organisation, um, would you be looking at these hobbyists to, to contact Airborne or whoever it may be who's exporting? So so what, we are, what, what the law says is that if you... Uh, bar to trade or sell honey, that product has to be processed through a correct food handling premises. Right. So part of that education is, is the awareness that uh, extracting your honey from a couple of hives in your garage, which would, would, have, would have and probably still is the norm, that's probably an unacceptable practice if that product's going into the food chain. So once again it comes back to education because correct. whoever it might be who's exporting needs to come and see me if I have the hives. Yep. So what we'd be encouraging is that those those hobbyist beekeepers that produce a surplus over above their own ability to consume, that product would be taken to a, a processing facility for extraction. Yes, yeah, sure. right. This organisation, if it, and it looks as though it's going to happen, they will be looking very closely at the 
the Manuka scandal, for the want of a better term. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, well, I don't know if I'd call it a scandal, but uh, uh, certainly it's, it's a, a scenario that we're very, very conscious of as an industry. Um, we need to make sure that our product is true to label and that we don't face any re repercussions from our international markets. Mm, so it's quality control, really? Absolutely. You know, and I mean, what's in the jar needs to be also what's on the label. And um, so w there is a lot of work going in from uh, the Ministry of Primary, for Primary Industries and, and the uh, the, the industry associations and, and uh, there's a working group, that, a liaison group that w comes together from time to time. And our focus is on making sure that uh, that we do produce standards for our product that can be achieved and that those standards can be replicated internationally so that we can protect the origin product that we have from New Zealand. Because you can actually test, as I understand it, to make sure that it is true to label and 80% of it is Manuka or Correct. whatever. Correct, yeah. So some of that testing uh, is under review now because we need to strengthen that. So that's part of the process we're going through right now. Isn't it interesting? Because people don't, don't think about it. They, they put the honey on the toast or they put the honey into their, their smoothies in the morning or whatever. But there's, it's an, as an industry, you're facing a lot of challenges. Correct. You know, it's, it's, our industry is growing up. And, and because we had the, a large lifestyle element historically, that, you know, it's all changing. You know, that lifestyle element is becoming really now it's quite a serious business. And you know, uh, good beekeepers and with good access to nectar sources and manuka etc., they have serious incomes today, and it is a really serious business. And we did need to make sure that we are doing it absolutely right. But you guys are t talking about people planting manuka. Correct. Yep. So we 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 already have a large PGB project going on now that's been uh, uh, shared with Convita in the North Island, and yes, they are planting large areas of nectar producing uh, manuka and it'll be very interesting to see how that progresses um, and what that develops into in the future. Why is the Manuka honey so expensive and so, so well sought after? Look, the, the demand internationally is massive. We can't produce enough product and with demand comes competition and we have now have countries competing with each other and of course that helps to leverage up the price for, for, from a New Zealand perspective. So and it's, it is about demand. It's no different to our red meat and we're seeing the red meat prices rising because our product's going into China and Asia, which are new markets for us. Uh, the same principle applies. And you know that's why we see other um, protein sources now becoming more evident in our, in our supermarket chain, such as uh, chicken and turkey and, and white meats and things like that becoming more prevalent. And very briefly, is Manuka only grown in New Zealand? No, no, Australia has a very large uh, range of manuka plants as well. So no, not at all. Um, we probably, it's quite possible that, that our manuka plants were blown across from Australia in the northwest winds, I don't know, but uh, many, many hundreds or well, millions of years ago. But um, no, they have a range of, of manuka over there and they also now have to comply with the same uh, food labelling requirements and all the other bits and pieces that are there uh, as the New Zealanders do. So we have a joint food standard. Great. Level playing ground. Correct. We, we actually Absolutely. like those jobs. Thank Absolutely. you very much.